Good morning, everyone. Good day, everyone, or good evening, everyone, depending on wherever you live. Um, welcome to the last full paper session of Eurovis 2021 for this year. Um, let me briefly introduce myself. My name is Jürgen Bernard. I'm assistant professor at the University of Zurich, and I'm leading the Visual Data Analysis Group and I have the pleasure to mo um, moderate the time series and animation session today. Time series is a very, very traditional session uh, at Euroviz and also at IEEE with often actually taking place as a very last thing on Friday morning. This year, not that much a problem. And uh, specifically this year, we have joint forces with animation papers, two of them to be exact, to be precise. So today in this session, we have a lot of interesting content uh, being combined from the video generation of data facets and facts, uh, animating static infographics. And on the time series side, we have a very complex situation where spatial temporal correlations are uh, investigated in combination with colors. And also we will see an interesting application about bicycle racing. To conclude, the contributions today will be experiments and studies, taxonomical work techniques and also applications. So a lot of good reasons to stay in this session, actually. This brings me to the first paper, which is about animation. And it's called Auto Clips, an automatic approach to video generation from data facts. The presenting author will be Dang Qing Chi, and he will present the work together with Fulning Sun, Jing Chi Yu, Jing Yu Lan, David Gotts, and Nan Zhao. Uh, Dan Jing will speak from Asia, so it's uh, early afternoon on his side of the world. Uh, David Gotts, for example, in North Carolina, uh, there is almost midnight, so it's good that actually Dan Jing is doing the talk. And um, finally, I want to say that all the other guys are from Tongji University in Shanghai in China. Floor is yours. Hello, I'm Dan Jing Shi from Tongji University. I'll be presenting our work, Auto Clips an automatic approach to video generation from data facts. This work is co-authored with Fu Ling Sun, Xin Yue Xu, Xin Yu Lan, David Gotts, and Nan Cao. Data videos is a visual storytelling form that combines data visualization with motion graphics are among the seven narrative visualization genres. Because of efficient information delivery and engagement with animation, data videos have been applied as an effective medium for data communication. For example, a famous data video, Wealthy Inequality in America, has gained more than 23 million views on YouTube and triggered heated discussion on social media. However, Creating a data video is not easy. To create a simplest data video, users not only need to craft the chart animations, but also have to synthesize these animations into a coherent story. Currently, few tools can achieve these two goals. For example, programming tools such as D3, GG Animate can generate animation for visualizations but are unable to compose stories. Design software such as Adobe AE is good at editing motion, but not specialized in creating data visualizations. In particular, mastering these tools requires expertise in either programming or design skills, which can be challenging for non-professional users. To ease the creation of data videos, some tools have been developed to support video authoring. For example, Data Clips provides a set of animation clips for visualizations such as bar charts, pictographs, and maps, so that users can choose the clips they want and organize the chosen clips into a video. Similarly, Flourish developed various templates for animated visualizations. User can create a video by editing templates and arranging them into a sequence. Although these above tools have improved the efficiency of creating data videos, there still remain two challenges for novices. 
what animations should be applied to visualizations, and how to arrange the animated visualizations into a story. Making such decision is still not easy for the novices. To resolve these two challenges, we present the design overview of our proposed system, Autoclips. According to the real-world practice, we found that the process of creating a data video usually comprises three main phases. First, the user collected a series of data facts around a certain topic and constructed a storyline by assembling the data facts into a sequence. Then, he chose data visualizations for the data facts and decided how to animate the visualizations. Finally, he edited and, and combined the animated visualizations until making a coherent data video. As the existing tool already supports the easy configuration of data facts from tabular data, Autoclips focus on reducing human efforts made to select animated visualizations and assemble individual clips. The import of Autoclips is the sequence of data facts. A data fact can be represented as a fact tuple structure, including fact type, subspace, breakdown, measure, and focus. In the definition, fact type indicates the category of information. Subspace defines the data scope. Breakdown divides the subspace into groups. Measure calculates each group's numerical value. Focus highlights the data item we need to pay attention to. For example, California is the state that votes most for Biden. It is a data fact whose fact type is extreme. It uses the data about Biden as subspace, the number of votes as measure, the states of the US as breakdown, and California as focus. Given the data facts, Autoclips first map each of the data facts to potential video clips. We derive the three design requirements. First, a clip should communicate the corresponding data fact clearly and effectively. Second, a clip should be distinguishable from the clips designed for other fact types. Third, a clip should use animation properly to guide viewers' attention and facilitate data perception. Next, Autoclips assembles the clips into a data video. We propose three design requirements. First, we should make sure that visualizations can be combined compatibly. Second, the data videos should be coherent. Third, the data videos should have proper durations. To map facts to clips, we built a fact-driven clip library in Autoclips. We watched 230 online data videos and identified 1,722 video clips that contain animated visualizations. Three of the authors label each of the clips from three aspects. What data fact does the clip convey? What visualization has been used to present the data fact? And what animation has been used to present the visualization? Based on the analysis result, we designed the video clips by referring to the top-ranked visualizations and animations used to present each data fact type in our corpus. We also involved 12 professional users into the design process to give us suggestions that help us improve the design of the clip library. At last, we arrived at final set of 36 clips. Our design finally covers 66.9% of the data visualization used in the corpus. We did not include pictographs because pictograph is usually highly related with semantic meaning of data. Passing this semantic meaning is beyond the scope of this work. The fact-driven clip library 
was implemented in the JavaScript language using the D3 framework. Each clip implements the visual encoding and a series of predefined motions independently. New clips can be flexibly extended to this library. Here, we showcase two clips. The first is outlier with bar. This fact points out the data points that significantly differ from others. To show outlier data, we first draw a benchmark line to show the mean value of all the data values. Then we highlight the outlier by drawing a red arrow pointing to the outlier. Also, to show the specialness of the outlier, all the other elements in the visualization fade to a lower opacity. The second is trend with line. This fact presents the tendency over a period of time. We first use animation to gradually display temporary data from left to right according to the convention that left donates the past and the right donates the future. Then we draw a line with an arrow to summarize the increase or decrease. You can check details for other clips in our paper or refer to this website to browse the animations. Here comes to the algorithm. This is the workflow of our algorithm. The input is the CSV data and facts, and the output is the generated data video. In summary, the autoclaves workflow consists of three steps. Clip selection, clip arrangement, and duration configuration. To better explain the algorithm, we use a story about the U.S. presidential election as our learning example. The dataset presents the number of votes that each of the presidential candidates received in different states in the United States. This is the overview of the data story containing eight data facts. Each fact is coded into a JSON format defined in the previous work. Here is the sum of all votes in the U.S. election. The distribution of votes for each candidate. Biden received the maximum number of votes. The distribution of Biden's votes across all the states. The votes for Biden by states sorted in descending order. And the distribution of Trump's votes across all the states. The votes for Trump by state sorted in descending order. Finally, there is the difference in votes between these two candidates. The first stage of the algorithm is clip selection. Since one fact may map to multiple potential video clips, the algorithm first needs to select an optimal clip for each of the data facts. We propose a reward function to find the clip sequence that maximizes the satisfaction of four computation features, including the transition cost, the parallel narrative structure, the visual consistency, and the diversity of visualizations. First, we suggested that the total transition cost should be minimized, because huge visual change in the visualization sequence may burden the audience coordination. The transition cost is the perception cost to track the visual changes between two consecutive visualizations. A parallel narrative structure adopts a repeated pattern to tell a story. Autoclips identifies the pattern and gives priority to use uniform clips for the parallel subsequences. In other words, Autoclips tends to use the same clips to display each subsequence in a parallel structure. 
Visual consistency requires you use consistent visual representations across different views. Therefore, Autoclaves asks for using consistent chat type for the same fact type and consistent visual encoding for the same data field. Last, it is better to use different visualizations to present different fact types to improve the discrimination among the data facts. Autoclaves defines diversity using the number of unique visualizations divided by the total number of fact types. After maximizes the reward function, Autoclave selects the clips to present the data facts. In the next step, Autoclave should arrange the clips into a coherent video sequence. To improve coherence, we considered two issues, how to smooth local transitions and how to better present parallel structure. A local transition is the transition between two consecutive clips. If two clips share common states, Autoclave will merge the animation of the two clips and omit unnecessary motions. If not, we simply use dissolve as the default transition effect. To facilitate the presentation of parallel content, Autoclips reorganizes the subsequence within the parallel structure and just poses two visualizations supported by the same type of data fact in one scene. In the last step, Autoclips configures the duration of the clips to ensure an optimal video length. We consider three issues. First, we want the data video to be short since a too long presentation time will disengage the viewers. Second, the animation should not be too fast, so that people can have enough time to perceive the visual changes. Third, viewers usually want to pay more attention to important facts, so the important parts in the video should be assigned longer durations. Autoclaves configures the duration using linear programming based on these three considerations, where T is the duration of the clip and the i is the importance of the corresponding fact. Here, the importance of fact can be set manually or be automatically calculated using existing statistic techniques. This is the keyframes of the final generated result. Let's see the video version. We conducted two controlled user studies, which evaluate the clips and the data videos generated by Autoclips. To assess whether the clips we proposed in the fact-driven clip library can combine data facts correctly, we conducted the first study to evaluate the clips with 30 participants. We presented the 36 clips in our library to the participants one by one. They were asked to respond from three aspects, including recognizability, comprehensibility, and engagement level. The study lasted around 25 minutes. Here is the user interface of the study one. During the study, the participants were allowed to replay the clips and leave comments. This table shows the accuracy of the recognition task. Column lists all clips in the library grouped by the effect type, where rows show how the participants interpreted the effect types of the clips. 
Correct responses are located along the diagonal of the table. Overall, 79.5% of the answers were correct with high confidence level. That means most clips were correctly recognized. Besides, the participants thought that the clips in our library were also comprehensible and engaging. In the second experiment, we compare auto clips with the human designer and the random generation as the baseline. We prepared six different data stories with different topics and created four versions of data facts for each of the story, including one by autoclips, one by human designer, and two by random generation. During the study, the participants were allowed to replay the videos. The study lasted around 50 minutes. Obviously, randomly generated data videos and long scores in all the six stories. And the data videos generated by autoclips had comparable scores with the videos manually created by human designers. Overall, autoclips was rated high in all stories. This result suggests that autoclips can generate data videos comparable to human work in this clip design space. There still remains a great deal of future work. First, we simplified the visual design space in this work so that the paper can focus on automated generation. In the next step, the perceptual effectiveness of each video clip needs more future research. Besides, other elements such as embellishments, chat transitions may also greatly impact the video representation. Second, autoclips currently only support tabular data. Continued research is needed to include diverse data types, such as graphs, spatial temporal data, or textual data. To conclude, we built the first fact-driven clip library by analyzing 230 online data videos and connecting interviews. We constructed an algorithm which generates data values from data facts through three steps, clip selection, clip arrangement, and duration configuration. We evaluated the effectiveness of autoclips via two controlled user studies. The results show that autoclips can generate comprehensible and engaging data values, which can significantly lower the barrier of creation of data values. Thanks for your listening. Thanks for that presentation. Thanks for that approach. Uh, I appreciate it a lot. I think the idea of a data-driven clip library is very interesting in combination with that algorithm. We got already five questions from quite popular people and from our community. And I will start in the order of appearance with a question from Wolfgang Eigner, uh, University of St. Pölten. How powerful is the format of data facts used? Uh, what I can add is that you're using JSON. So what are its limits? Is it based on some kind of fact grammar? Is, it, is there a relation with legal light or other types of grammars underlying? That's the question. Okay. 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 Uh, thanks everyone for listening to my talk. I think this question is about the data fact. Uh, currently, we use the data fact to represent the content of the story. And uh, the definition uh, in the fact includes uh, five parameters, including uh, type, subspace, measure, uh, breakdown, and the focus. Mm, I think uh, the, mm, it, it can cover the most of the possible types in the data story, including trend, distribution, rank, and other type types. Uh, and its definition is defined in the previous work. Uh, I think the limitation may be the user should first uh, describe the, their content into the fact format, or user can use some, some tools to edit a, a fact. And uh, Yes, it's, uh, 
it's a declaratory grammar, uh, such as the uh, like the big light, yeah, and it can be written in the JSON format. I have similar. Yeah, I think this can answer the question. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you you, you know, um, sort of uh, it's good to be uh, to hear and there, but that's totally fine. I also thought about maybe that there are requirements to the input format to be compatible to your approach. I'll proceed to the next question, which is from Christian Tuminski, University of Rostock. How does the pipeline slash algorithm ensure that the proposed requirements are met? Um, there were quite strong requirements. So our related question. Okay. Um, we, we design a reward function that can that try, that, uh, uh, try to optimize all the objectives. Mm, but we just to ensure the overall overall reward is optimized. Maybe sometimes the individual objective is not very high. So I think the the results can be um, pretty good if the the most of the object is fulfilled. Okay. Mm -hmm. I will proceed to a question that was formed by Jason Dykes, City University of London. I want to ask a question about the relationship between automation, facts, and trustworthiness. There is an authority to automation that might hinder critique. Any thoughts or concerns? Yes, I think it depends on the, uh, the use case. Of course, the automation, um, there are some very uh, useful scenario for the uh, automation, like if someone want to, um, someone or some company want to produce huge amounts of data videos in a very short time, or it can help the, the non-expert user to, to create a data video in a very short time. Mm. And also for the expert, they may just use, use the automation to give them some advice and they can further to uh, also the data video by themselves after that. Yeah. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. I will proceed to the uh, second last question, uh, again, uh, performed by Wolfgang Eigner. Is there an end user GUI for auto clips? Oh, okay. Uh, currently, we do not implement an online editor or online online system. This paper focused on the automatic process. Uh, however, we plan to implement this system into our previous work. It's an online system named, named Calliope. And I will then paste the link into the Discord channel. Uh, uh, in the future, we will incorporate the method in the autoclase into this system. Last question um, is about uh, data facts that you are using as a term. Uh, when I read the paper, I thought, hmm, data facts, a very data-driven perspective. Um, in, in the risk community, we often talk about observations, findings, and insights, and knowledge. And in parallel, there is also very much research about tasks, so a task-driven way mm -hmm. of forming and structuring things. So what's the relation between a data fact and these different types of things I just mentioned. Um, yes, I think the data facts, uh, the most related um, concept is the data insight. Uh, in my opinion, that uh, not all of the data fact is the data insight. Maybe some data fact is, uh, is no, no nonsense. Right, um, just, just heard uh, some general knowledge, but the data insight may be some interesting data fact. So I think uh, that's the relationship between these two concepts. And the, the task, the task may be the approach to to find the data fact or the data insight. Okay, that's my answer. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that there is a strong relation that you can find here and there. Totally fine by me. I'm sorry, Thomas, Hurt, that I cannot uh, propose your question because we're simply running out of time. 
And there's a lot of applause in the chat and also very nice words. So you can read them afterwards. And this would conclude the Q&A for our first paper. Let's thank the speaker again. We are back with the second talk of our full video session, which is animated presentation of static infographics with InfoMotion. So another animation-based approach, and it is presented by Yang Wang, uh, together with the colleagues Yi Gao, He Wang, Wai Wai Chu, Hai Dong Zhang, and Dong Mei Zhang. Uh, it's a collaborative research done by Microsoft Research Asia and Nanjing University. Floor is yours. Hi, my name is Yun Wang, and I am a researcher from Microsoft Research Asia. I am happy to take this opportunity to introduce you our work, animated presentation of static infographics with InfoMotion. This is a collaborative work from Microsoft Research Asia and Nanjing University with my teammates Yi, Ray, Weiwei, Haidong, and Dongmei. Infographics present contents narratively. They can convey messages, present insights, and they are aesthetically pleasing. With well-crafted animations, infographics can produce impressive and memorable presentations and improve users' engagement. Professional designers create animations for data videos, digital news, and so on, and non-experts also leverage animations for their data reports and presentations. However, it is not easy to create animations. Expert users usually adopt video creation tools like After Effects and Premiere and programming toolkits like D3 and processing, which are hard to learn and use. Non-experts might use presentation tools like PowerPoint and Keynote, and they are easy to learn, but still very tedious and time-consuming to create animations. Even worse, non-experts may lack design expertise and may not have ideas to create delicate animated infographics. Take PowerPoint as an example. Designing an animation like this one on the right is not easy. Designers need to manually group elements, arrange animation orders, set duration and delay, select animation effects and options for each visual element and element groups. Recently, more authoring tools have been designed, such as commercial tools like Flourish and Visme, and research tools like Data Clips. They support animations through a template editing manner. The system developers need to create animated infographic templates in advance. However, with this approach, the designs are hard to scale. The number of templates limit the richness of the resulting animations. On the other hand, Canis and Gemini propose high-level languages to help users. But they focus on standard charts such as bar chart and pie chart, which can be easily represented by well-structured forms such as Vega Light. The rows of each visual element, such as lines and circles, are clearly assigned as marks and axes. However, the visual elements in an infographics are usually not structured semantically. This led us to think of this question, how to significantly reduce the efforts of designing animations. We design a framework to automatically generate animated presentations with just one click. InfoMotion takes a reverse engineering way to represent infographics. 
While existing work on reverse engineering visualizations only target standard charts such as bar charts and line charts, InfoMotion more flexibly cover a wide variety of infographics with InfoMotion structures that infographics can be organized. So this way, different animation strategies can be further configured to cater various needs of expressive and animated presentations. With a static infographic as input, InfoMotion can recommend a list of animations as output for users to choose. They can further specify their preferences to get an ideal animation design. So here, let me show you some example animations generated by InfoMotion. Taking the static infographic as input on the left, InfoMotion can generate animations on the right. The animation pane on the right shows the animation effects and time arrangements applied to the visual elements. InfoMotion can take infographics with different layouts. Apart from the linear ones, it can also process these radial ones. These can also be automatically generated. To enable auto-generation, we first conduct an empirical study to understand the design process and design space of animated infographics. Then we propose InfoMotion, our technique that consists of two modules, infographic structure inference and animation arrangement. Finally, we demonstrate the experiment results, example applications, and our user study. First, let me introduce um, our empirical study. We conduct an empirical study on a real-world data set. The data set contains about more than 200 professional animation designs. The design examples come from the design tutorials and design templates. We use keywords including the combination of infographic, animation, tutorial, presentation, and so on. We summarize our findings as a design process that contains three steps. Understanding infographic structure, determining layout patterns, and arranging animated presentations. And I will illustrate them one by one. To apply animations to infographics, we need to first understand the underlying relations of visual elements. Therefore, we first analyze the structures of infographic design. Here, we take a bottom-up approach. An infographic is composed of many basic elements, such as text boxes, shapes, and images. The basic visual elements can further compose infographic components, which are element groups that can be perceived as a complete object, such as title, footnote, and so on. Infographics usually contain repeating units, which are used to illustrate the ideas from many aspects. The design of repeating units are similar across units. Within each unit, they can further contain components such as unit title, unit description, and so on. The similar elements across the units also form element groups. An element group contains semantically similar elements that belong to different repeating units and contribute to the design of each repeating unit. Designers may place visual units into different layout patterns, forming information flows. 
We summarize four main styles of infographic unit layouts we found in our dataset. They are linear layout, radial layout, segmented layout, and freeform layout. After gaining an understanding on the infographic structure, we can determine the information flow for animations based on the infographic structure. The two most popular ways of presenting information are by element groups or by repeating units. If the elements are shown by group, you may see all the element titles first, descriptions next, and so on. And if the elements are shown by units, you can see the elements shown in unit one by one. The information flow determines the animation order, and we need to further put them on the timeline. That is, to determine for each element and each animation effect when to start and when to end. This is quite complex because different combinations may have totally different results. So to reduce the complexity of this problem, we summarize three common ways of arranging animations all at once, staggering, and one by one. For high-level logics, one by one is most commonly used, while other choices are used for low-level time arrangements. With the design process analyzed, we propose our auto-generation method with two steps. The first step is to understand the infographic structure from the input, and the second step is to arrange the animations based on the structures. InfoMotion takes static vector infographics as input and passes the infographic designs into a set of visual elements such as text boxes, shapes, and icons, and their properties such as position, color, and size. Then we try to find repeating units to infer information structures. Repeating units are designed with regularity to achieve a pleasing visual effect. Visual elements across units are usually similar but not exactly the same. For example, sibling shapes in an element group may have the same size but with different colors. Sibling text boxes may have different contents, lengths, but they may have similar font. Identifying them requires considerations of different similarity measurements. So we first do clustering for the visual elements. We compute the size of each cluster and then find the commonest size n, and this means that many clusters have and similar elements. In this example, the commonest size is 6. After extracting many clusters, we assign them to repeating units. So to divide them into units, we need to take advantage of the regularity and proximity principles. For example, the elements are placed in regular and harmonious pattern across units, and the layouts should be similar across element groups. The designers usually avoid crossing and long distance for relative elements. So we design an algorithm to merge the clusters into the repeating units, and the details of the algorithm can be found in our paper. After organizing elements into repeating units, we can further identify connectors between units and determine the sequences. Connectors are a special type of repeating unit, 
we search through visual elements of lines and arrow shapes that fall into the regions between any two units, and we finally attach the layout text to the infographics. Then the animations are generated by the combination of different design choices. At the slide level, the animations need to decide the information flow. Then at the unit level, we can arrange time within and between units. We further apply animation effects for each visual component. The animation effects are selected based on a decision tree trained by 461 element effect pairs that we manually labeled. Finally, we introduce our experiments on structure inference, example applications, and user study on the resulting animations. To evaluate our approach, we manually pre-processed infographic design files we collected from our empirical study, adding up to 120 static infographics. From these infographics, we got about 80% success rate. We further conduct a user study. The study is designed as pairwise comparisons between designer-crafted ones and auto-generated animations. The participants are asked to rate from minus 3 to 3, ranging from the one is strongly better than the other, to neutral, to the one is strongly worse than the other one. Overall, the results are very positive. The ratings between auto-generated and designer-crafted animations are very close. 13 out of 18 have no significant differences between generated and designer-crafted ones. After the interview, participants also gave positive feedback. They have also shown quite different personal preferences. For example, some participants prefer long animations, while others prefer shorter ones, meaning that it is important to provide the design panels. To illustrate the usefulness of information, we developed a proof of concept application in the form of a PowerPoint add-in. When you click Information, it shows the structures we have built for the infographic. You can see the elements by units and by groups. Clicking on an element, you can change the effect options and refresh the animation effects. For example, you can change from zoom to wipe change the direction of the animation, change the duration, and change from fade to fly. You can also adjust the pacing and speed of the animations. And this makes it slower. When you click on the Ideas button, it shows a pool of design candidates. You can click on Detail button to further customize each result. When click on the Apply button, the PPT animations are directly added. To summarize, in this research, we propose information that can automatically generate animation design from static infographics. Our technique can be utilized to enhance people's presentation, and we further evaluate our approach through experiments, user study, 
and example applications. We are excited that information will be available as a PowerPoint add-in soon. Please visit our website for more up-to-date information. Thank you. And that concludes the second talk of this presentation. And uh, I'm receiving a lot of positive feedback from the audience, nice comments in Discord, for example. Unfortunately, Yang Bang is not here today, so we cannot ask questions, which is a bit disappointing because there are some. Um, so let me quickly summarize the questions that have been raised so far, at least from my perspective, and after that we will continue to the next talk. So questions would have been like uh, the taxonomy that has been presented and the observational study that has been done before that and how these observations, these code observations have been transformed to this nice taxonomy. Or uh, a bit of provoking question, uh, if shortcomings in Microsoft Excel and PowerPoint have to be sort of addressed in this nice approach to mitigate this gap. Um, also, Christian Tominski applauds for the nice designs, but asks about the visual encoding study is a bit missing. Related to that, a question that I prepared uh, about commonalities and differences in the use of rather semantically rich icons versus the rather general ways of visual mappings using marks and channels for abstract data. And Wesco Smith is uh, interested in the use of the tool, but it is uh, supposed to be downloadable soon. So we are all waiting to that. It will be a PowerPoint plugin, actually, what I can read from the paper. Uh, similarly to that, I had a question about uh, if these nicely coded 203 designs of these animated infographics, if these collections are made publicly available as an open source tool to replicate the study. And finally, there uh, is a raised question by Jason Dykes about the time it takes to make all these amazing options and if automation is necessary to do that. Um, there is more in the chat, so maybe we have the chance to meet the author later on, and I will yeah, continue to the third talk. And here it is, the third talk of this session, and we are entering time series land now. The title of the paper is called Uncertainty Aware Visualization of Regional Time Series Correlation in Spatiotemporal Ensembles. That sounds complex. It is presented by Karim Husman. The first author is Marina Evers, and uh, the mentor in the back is Lars Linsen. All of them are from the Westfälische Wilhelms University in Münster. My name is Karim Husman, and together with Marina Evers, we are going to give you a presentation on uncertainty-aware visualization of regional time series correlation in spatial-temporal ensembles. Spatial-temporal ensemble data is frequently used to study uncertainties in various natural phenomena. One example are climate simulations, where simulation ensembles are created to cover uncertain initial conditions. In this data, each spatial sample point contains a time series for each ensemble member. The correlation between these time series provides insights into the structural properties of the data. However, the number of pairwise correlations grows quadratically with the number of spatial sample points. This makes it challenging to keep the computation times for a global spatial correlation analysis in a feasible range, especially if time lags between the time series are taken into account to detect further patterns. Ensemble data leads to further challenges because the uncertainty needs to be considered. The existing techniques focus either on the local analysis or select a single sample point which they use as a reference for correlation calculations. To address these challenges, we propose a two-step approach. In the first step, we want to create a spatial visualization of global correlations, which we refer to as a similarity image. With help of this single image, we are able to encode global correlations by color. Here, the more similar colors appear, the higher correlated the time series are. This provides a quick overview about the underlying structure of the ensemble. In the second step, we propose an interactive analysis of correlations among spatial regions, which is based on the similarity image. We start by creating a hierarchical segmentation of the image. 
In the following, we work on the segments and the corresponding segment means, which significantly reduces the computational costs. The resulting data can be analyzed in three interactively linked visualizations, which are shown here. The heat map shows the probability of a correlation in the ensemble as well as the time lags. This view is closely linked to the segmentation visualization to provide special information. We include an uncertainty aware time series plot for in detail investigation. In the following, we will explain both steps in more detail, starting with the computation of the similarity image. To calculate the pairwise spatial correlations for ensemble data, we need to generalize the calculation of correlations to ensembles. For each spatial sample, we have time series for each member. This leads to a set of time series for each sample point. For ensemble data, we want to consider the correlation between two time series of the same member. We decide to concatenate the time series of the individual members, which leads to less information loss than using, for example, means. For each space to sample point, we concatenate all time series of each member. This leads to one joint time series per sample point that contains the information of the whole ensemble on this spatial point. Now we can calculate the correlation between each of these concatenated time series using the Pearson correlation coefficient. This results in a correlation matrix containing all pairwise correlations between the spatial samples. Our goal is to encode correlation by color. Thus, we need to find a way to embed the correlation information in a three-dimensional color space. Therefore, we calculate a distance matrix from the correlation matrix. Here, we treat a high positive correlation as a small distance, while we interpret a high negative correlation as a large distance. We map the correlation Cij from the range minus 1 to 1 to a distance in the range between 0 and 1. Then, we use this distance matrix to create a 3D embedding, which we can directly map to colors later. As the distances in the embedding should represent the distances in the high-dimensional space, we choose multidimensional scaling as a dimensionality reduction technique. The 3D embedding shows the correlation of the sample points, but does not contain the spatial information. Now, we map each embedded point position to a color, which we can use in the spatial domain. We choose the Scilab color space because it is designed to be perceptually uniform. Thus, Euclidean distances of points in the color space correspond to perceptual differences of colors. To make the best use of the color space, we translate and rotate the embedded points for the best utilization of the given space. In the lower left, one can see the embedding where the points are color coded according to their position. Next, we assign the color to the corresponding spatial location in the original domain. As a result, we obtain the similarity image that you already saw in the beginning. In this image, similar colors show a high correlation, while very different colors show an anti-correlation. Now, we can use the similarity image as a base for further interactive visual analysis. We use the similarity image to define regions on different levels of detail. This allows an interactive analysis on different levels of granularity. We choose a graph-based watershed algorithm because it is very fast and the graph-based structure allows a large flexibility in the choice of the geometry of the data. This is especially important for the application to, for example, global climate simulation data because the Earth provides a spherical domain. The watershed algorithm works on a gradient image. While there's a wide range of methods for gradient calculation available, we include two approaches to our work. The first option uses the Euclidean distance between two color values. This leads to sharp edges, but might also cause over-segmentation. The second option uses a Sobel filter, which is among the simplest operators for edge detection and is better suited for data with smooth transitions. We store the hierarchical segmentation together with further aggregated data in a tree data structure where each node represents one segment as represented here. The leaves of the tree represent the smallest units on which we will work in the following steps. Thus, the number of nodes in our tree structure does not scale with the data resolution but with the information contained in the data. 
For each segment on every level of detail, we calculate the mean time series for each member and store it in our data structure. This allows immediate access at interactive rates during the analysis. To make sure that the segments are sufficiently smooth, we also store the minimal and maximal pairwise correlation of the associated sample points. This allows the user to spot segments with strong internal variations or projection errors during the interactive analysis. In the following steps, we will work with the stored mean time series because it significantly reduces the amount of data and thus the computational cost. This allows us to also include a time lag into the correlation calculation. Sometimes, two time series are highly correlated but a bit shifted, as can be seen here. We calculate correlation values for a set of possible time lags. The range of allowed time sets can be defined by the user and is an application-specific value. We store the time lag for which the highest correlation occurs. After calculating the pairwise correlations for each ensemble member separately, we calculate the percentage of members that surpass a user-defined threshold. In this way, we obtain a probability for a correlation between two segments. We perform these computations for all segments on all levels of detail to allow interactive continuous changes. Up to now, all computations can be done in a preprocessing step, which allows the following interactive visual analysis. In addition to the similarity image, we include three further visualizations. One visualization shows the segmentation, where we color each segment and the mean color of the corresponding samples in the similarity image. In this view, the user can interactively select the watershed level, which determines the granularity of the segmentation. This allows to globally change the level of detail. It is also possible to locally refine a single region. The user can select a segment and change the watershed level of this particular segment. This is shown here for the case of the brown segment at the center. We visualize the correlation probabilities between the segments in a heat map. We use a divergent color map where the sign indicates whether the correlation is positive or negative. Each segment is represented by a row and a column of the heat map and labeled by its color. We also color code the time lag for which the highest probability of a correlation exists. This information is shown in the center of each cell and can be hidden by the user to reduce visual complexity. We further simplify the interpretation by ordering the heat map according to a hierarchical clustering. This allows to detect groups of correlated segments more easily. Since the heat map itself contains no special information, we closely link it to the region visualization for better orientation. In addition to the consistent segment colors in all visualizations, we include interactive linking. If the user hovers over a segment in the region visualization or over a cell in the heat map, the segment is highlighted in both visualizations. This can be seen here with the pink borders. We also support brushing in the heat map to highlight a group of segments in all visualizations. While the previous visualizations focus on the correlation, we include a direct time series visualization as an in-detail visualization of a single region. The segments for which the time series are shown can be selected either in the region visualization or in the correlation heat map. Here you can see a time series visualization for four segments. In this visualization, we can include the spread of the possible values of the whole ensemble. Therefore, we use an adaption of functional box plots. We show the median curve, which you can see as the central line here. We found that the ensemble data is relatively noisy, which would lead to a large number of outliers in traditional functional box plots. That is why we deviate from the functional box plots approach and show bands that span the whole range, which can be referred to as 100% bands. Thus, these bands show all possible values from the minimum in the ensemble to the maximum. Use the same colors for the time series as we use in the segments in the other visualizations to also include a visual linking with this plot. Now that we have introduced the methodology, we want to look into some results of our approach. 
First, let's use a synthetic dataset in order to get an understanding how the similarity image will look like for a minimalistic example. For each spatial sample, we create a time series using different functions as depicted in this figure. Each function is sampled at 300 time steps with a resolution of 0.1. We generate 10 ensemble members by adding noise to each respective function. We chose these functions since there are some obvious correlations and anti-correlations between some time series. Now creating the similarity image, we end up in this picture as can be seen here on the right. Note that the colors on the left are randomly picked by us, the colors on the right emerge from applying our approach. So what do we see here? Regions 1 and 9 are correlated to region 7 since both regions hold a sine function. This is depicted by the similar dark blue color. By definition, region 2 is anti-correlated to the previously mentioned regions 1, 7 and 9. When looking at the colors, we perceive a huge difference between these two groups. Region 3, 4 and 8, all holding a linearly increasing function, are correlated to region 6, a quadratically increasing function, which again is depicted by the similar color. We now segment the similarity image using the hierarchical watershed approach. The associated correlation heat map reveals some more details into the underlying correlation. Here we can confirm the previously described anti-correlation of the orange region to the dark blue ones. Additionally, we can see an anti-correlation to the cyan colored segment, but only when taking a time lag of 15 time steps into account, which is encoded by the green little squares. The cyan colored region is also correlated to the dark blue segments with a time lag of 15 time steps, which is equivalent to shifting the function by approximately pi over 2. Having validated our approach with this artificial example, where all results are in line with our expectations, we are now going to present some real-world data results. Here we use the Max Planck Institute Grand Ensemble dataset and discuss the results with a scientist who has been working with climate data for decades. This dataset is one of the largest climate simulation ensembles out there. It consists of 100 members with 1128 time steps and we analyze the 2 meter temperature scalar field. Here we can see the course of temperature for a selected sample point in a single run. We observe a 12 month repeating oscillation pattern with an overall increase in temperature throughout the whole simulated time. Note that this is a pretty good representative on how most sample points behave. In the second picture we take a closer look at two grid points. One is located in the northern hemisphere, the other in the southern hemisphere. The northern and southern time series show a very high anticorrelation, which is to be expected due to the six months shifted seasonality of the two hemispheres. When creating the similarity image as described before, we end up in this visualization. All in all, this single picture gives us an understanding on how spatial correlations are distributed. In this case, the output reflects our intuition for a monthly weather simulation of the Earth. The perceived color distance between pink and blue reflects the anticorrelation between northern and southern hemisphere. Their respective oceanic regions can clearly be distinguished from the continental regions, leading to a prominent highlighting of the coastlines. Starting from the similarity image, we now perform the hierarchical watershed segmentation. Here we see the segmentation for different levels of detail. Spatial points with positively correlated time series share a similar color and are merged into segments, allowing for a more manageable detailed correlation analysis. Now juxtaposing the segmentation view with the linked correlation heat map, we obtain a detailed insight on how segments are correlated with each other. Most segments show a very high certainty for correlations, but some regions on the other hand seem to have a higher variation throughout the ensemble, which may be worth investigating. The time lag shown as the little boxes for each segment pair, also reflects the six-month seasonality shift of the northern and southern hemispheres. Here, the respective segments are correlated but with a time lag of plus minus six months. Now this results gave us an intuition on how the visualization will look like for a dataset with pretty intuitive pattern. But in the raw dataset, the variance of monthly temperature is mostly dominated by the seasonal cycle. Therefore, we derived anomalies with respect to the climatological mean monthly value of a 10-year period. 
the overall trend of the resulting time series show a noisy linear increase in temperature of several Kelvin throughout the whole simulated time until year 2099. The similarity image of this adjusted dataset looks like this. The most regions follow the general trend of increasing temperature, which is reflected by the widespread reddish color. But there are a few regions where the underlying time series seem to behave noticeably different. This is depicted by the greenish and bluish colors contrasting to the red regions. When discussing these results with a climate expert, we were pointed out that two regions may be linked to already known phenomena, namely the El Niño phenomenon and North Atlantic warming hole. These phenomena can be seen in more detail when looking at the line plots for the segments of these regions. The El Niño region shows a repeating pattern every three to five years, which is in line with the domain expert's expectations. The North Atlantic warming hole shows a relatively constant temperature for a certain time span. Also, an annual oscillation is clearly visible even though we removed the seasonality. Comparing it to a red region, we can see the differences of these two dedicated phenomena to the widespread global warming phenomenon. So these were two regions clearly highlighted by our visualization, which are in line with known climatological phenomena. But when further looking on the similarity image, we see that there are even more regions which may be worth investigating for a climate expert. Let's conclude our work. We defined a two-step approach which helps analyzing global correlations and their uncertainties in spatial-temporal ensembles. The first step was the creation of a color-coded spatial visualization which gives the user an insight on how spatial correlations are distributed in a given ensemble. In the second step, we made use of the similarity image by deriving segmentations, heat maps, and line plots. The only user-defined parameter are maximum time lag and correlation threshold, which are domain-specific characteristics. We want to point out that even though we only presented 2D results, in principle, all steps also work for 3D spatial domains. The main challenge would be to find suitable visualization for the segmentation to provide a global overview without suffering from occlusion. An implementation of our approach can be found at GitHub. Feel welcome to check it out and contribute. We want to thank Michael Bettinger for his domain expert insight, the DFG for funding, and of course we want to thank you for your attention. We are happy to take your questions. Hi Karim. Um, thank you Karim and Marina, by the way, for the presentation, so I was confused. Marina did the presentation, most of it, and you are here for Q&A. Welcome. Um, you presented an approach that is quite complex from a data perspective regarding time series being univariate or multivariate, possibly geospace, 2D, 3D, uh, ensembles one or multiples of it, and uncertainty stemming from different sources, such as data uncertainty or process uncertainty, whatever. Very complex stuff. Uh, congratulations to your uh, solution. I have received a series of questions, uh, more than I can tell. Uh, I will start with the first one by uh, Wolfgang again. Is the structure inference based purely on the decomposition of used elements, relying on grouping, hierarchical decomposition, or also on perceptual groupings like Gestalt laws? Uh. Sorry, uh, can you rephrase this question, please? <laughs> um, for the sake of time, maybe um, you answer this one in the chat because it's rather. Yeah, I think. I think yeah. because we are. Yeah, ahead. I think so too. Uh, Jason Dykes, Thank you. Uh, no, no worries. All good, I think. Uh, Jason Dykes is asking: uh, Good to avoid info loss by using all time time series in ensemble, but don't the discontinuities between concatenated time series cause problems with any autocorrelation calculation? Um, I'm not sure, but since we are not using autocorrelation, we really only used pairwise correlations, we didn't see a big problem in concatenating all time series. Maybe I can add to this. Uh, can you comment on the always existing problem between global measures and local measures in local time series? and how your approach relates to that? Uh, global 
So, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, the global what? Using global. local measures or local measures within time series. So depending on which one you are using, you are always missing some signals that you may find or not find. This is true. Um, yeah. Um, so we are not really, uh, yeah, I don't know. Sorry, I cannot answer this question now. <laughs> no worries. I will paste it in the chat afterwards. Okay. Donati is asking another question. Quite many parameters and user-defined thresholds are used. What is about the sensitivity of them? Um, I think one uh, major advantage of our approach is that we only have two user-defined parameters, which is uh, the yeah the uh, the maximum time lag, uh, which we are uh, yeah which is a domain-specific uh, value. So a domain expert is choosing this value, and the other is uh, the. Uh, is the, uh, the the level of detail when analyzing it. Uh, so I think these are the two only parameters uh, we the user needs to set when using this approach. Got that, thank you. Um, Tala bin Mashud is asking a question. If I understood correctly, color values are used for watershed-based segmentation. Why not use the correlation values scalar field itself for segmentation? Yeah, um, we, we considered this. Uh, so uh, in the paper, we also stated that the segmentation could have been done in a much higher dimensional space, um, um, not only on the three-dimensional color space, but we want to reflect the, the segmentations better to the colors, perceived colors, the colors in the image. So when we do the segmentation in another space than the colors, then there it may be that uh, segments are created which yeah, don't reflect the colors anymore. And if there is a huge variation in, 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 in these segments, uh, our visualization will highlight it and uh, yeah, maybe yeah, give the user an idea of what to optimize or what to refine a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Talking about users, Jason is asking, hope the graphics allow climate scientists to find new things too. Any evidence on this? Um, yeah, uh, since the domain expert uh, we work with is uh, happy to do a follow-up on this paper and we are planning to do something uh, more application focused uh, with climate uh, researchers. So I think uh, the experts see a potential in our approach, yeah. Yeah, I guess so. This, uh, I think this certainly makes sense if you, if you can see this evidence. Um, due to time constraints, let me pose a last question from my side, which is about the non-trivial mapping from something high dimensional to color in a similarity preserving way. This is something that is very interesting, but you're not the first one who did this. Um, depending on the challenges that you discover in this non-trivial mapping step, um, which guidelines from earlier research in this did you consider talking about perceptual linearity, or the saliency of colors, or the distance to background, or the exploitation of color depending on the space you are using. So not your solution, your technical solution, but the guidelines that the visualization community already provides. Um, because yeah, uh, you uh, described in the paper, but not the guidelines, that's why I'm asking. Yeah, um, so uh, I, I really have to think about this now. Um, Um, can we take it offline to the Discord too? <laughs> Fair enough, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, Karim, there are more questions. Uh, I'm sorry that I decided that every uh, every um, attendee only can ask one question, otherwise it was simply be too much. But maybe you can answer these questions later. Yeah, on. I will, of course. Yes. And we'll proceed to the fourth paper as a next step. Thank you, Karim, once again. Thank you too. Bye bye. Yeah, and just to complete my last sentence, this brings us to something very applied. It's all about bicycles for the next 25 minutes. The paper is called Tourist Narrative Visualization of Multi-Stage Bicycle Races, and it's presented by Jose Diaz, Marta Ford, and Per Paul Pau, uh, Vasquez. And actually, Per Pau is also presenting and doing the Q&A. My name is Pere Pau and I'm going to talk about the visualization of bicycle races. Multi-stage cycling races are competitions that span for several weeks 
and nowadays participants can be tracked thanks to the use of GPS devices. Enthusiasts can obtain real-time information through TV broadcasts or special purpose web applications, but they can also use other sources of information such as newspaper chronicles or infographics. However, none of these methods is adequate if you want to get proper insights of what happened along the race. TV broadcasts and specialized web apps, which provide more details, only show the information in real time, and the exploration possibilities are limited or no. Other sources do not provide enough details, often on the final rankings and cannot be explored. So, to solve these problems, we have created a multi-view application that facilitates exploratory analysis of multiple stage bicycle races, but it also could be applied to other racing competitions. One of the main objectives we had was to provide a means to explore what happened along the stage, since there is currently no way an enthusiast can get sense of what happened along the route. For example, to answer questions such as, where their breakaways? How did the leader fare? As well as getting many other details, such as the rankings in the different categories, points, and so on, there is no current system that allows the user to get. Perrin and colleagues categorize the sport visualization systems in three groups, according to the main source of data they deal with. In the first group, we find research in the visualization of box score data, which is data related to points, goals, and so on, which is quite sport specific. Another category is the one that deals with track data, which commonly concentrates on elements such as player or team movements or pulse trajectories. The third group deals with metadata, which refers to data that is more loosely related to the sport activity. Regarding the concrete case of bicycle races, some research has addressed some problems related to the analysis of metadata, such as the pedaling forces or aerodynamic flows. And there is a previous work, which is closely related to our work, due to Wood, where he analyzed the personal performance of cyclists. In our case, we want to keep track of features that are relevant to multi-stage races. In order to understand what we want to visualize, it's important to first review some of the main features of cycling races. Professional cycling races typically have up to 200 riders divided into 22 teams. And for multiple stages, the time of the participants is accumulated through all the stages and the winner is the one that has a lower time at the end. One very important feature that is typical from bicycle races, but also from other sports, is the presence of groups. At the beginning of a stage, all riders start together. But along its development, some groups are created and disbanded. When a group successfully opens a gap between them and the big group, called peloton, it's called a breakaway. And some other cyclists may try to catch them in other groups, which are called chasing groups. This behavior is important for several reasons. First, at finish line, all the members of a group are assigned the same time than the first one crossing the line. Second, members of groups, even from different teams, can collaborate to escape from the main group if they consider they can get some benefits. In the same way, sometimes some members of the group will try to preserve the energies by staying behind the others so that they don't suffer as much aerodynamic pressure than the ones leading the group. Besides the groups, there is a lot of other information that needs to be tracked when dealing with these kinds of races. The shape of a stage is very important because participants have different physical characteristics. Some of them are more capable of climbing mountains in stages, while others are specialists in sprints at the end of a stage. We also need to monitor the teams with its members, the classifications of participants in the different rankings, general mountain regularity, and so on and so forth. To put some order in this bunch of information that can be captured, we proceeded the following way. First, we created a list of requirements based on our knowledge, and we checked what information is commonly provided in newspaper chronicles. Then, in order to contrast with the interest of real users, we passed a questionnaire to several members of two cycling clubs. With this information, we created a set of requirements, which is more detailed in the paper, and it's somehow summarized here. First, 
we need to provide access to the elements that were considered relevant, such as position and timing of all the riders during the stage, at finish, and other points of interest, such as special sprints. Second, complex queries must be accessed simply. For example, checking the evolution of all members of a team along a stage, or communicating virtual leadership changes. We also need to include a method to navigate through different stages. And finally, it's also very important, the support of visual analysis and exploration of groups. So the resulting application is shown here. First, on the left, we have the view, which is called race overview, which let us change between the different stages. Second, in the center, we have the stage view that summarizes what happened along the stage. On the right, we have the selection panel that lets us filter among team members or individuals. On bottom left, we have the stage rankings view, which shows the rankings at the end of the stage. On bottom right, we have the details on demand view, which will show rankings at the points of interest that can be selected. Finally, bottom right, show the details of the selected teams or riders. The stage view also has different components. On top, we can see the details of the stage. In the center, we can see the participants' positions, which is the most relevant part of our visualization system. At this point, we had an important design decision to make, how to encode this 2D view. We had to choose what variables would be encoded, where we set the origin, how they are scaled, and we wanted to effectively communicate the evolution of the stage by providing visual cues for the position, ranking, and times of the riders, but also to communicate the presence and size of the groups, which is also relevant because the larger the group, the higher the threat and that may be for trailing cyclists. For X, we decided to use the distance, since it's the most common approach used by media when creating infographics or animations. For why, we had different possibilities that have been used previously, but that do not properly satisfy our needs. One of the obvious choices is time, but using it directly would hinder the presence of groups. After testing the different possibilities and evaluating how well they were communicating the data, we ended up using Y to encode time and groups at the same time. We did so by devoting one pixel per second and one pixel per rider. This facilitates communicating time, position, and size of the groups. And except for stages where there are huge differences in time between the riders, the whole chart usually fits in a regular monitor. The result is a Sankey-like diagram, where the groups are identified with a small ellipsoid whose vertical size depends on the number of members of the group. Individual riders, as well as all the members of a team, can be selected and highlighted, and their positions at the end of the stage are also highlighted. Time gaps are illustrated with labels, mostly on demand to avoid cluttering the view. Finally, riders whose GPS signal is lost are separated from the rest of the riders. The main view also shows the stage profile in another component as illustrated here. In this view, the sampled kilometers are shown and can be selected. Upon selection, the ranking of the participants at this point is shown in the details on demand view. Besides kilometer points, there are other points of interest along a stage, which can be special sprints or mountain passes. The first competitors that cross these landmarks are assigned points that are valid for the regularity or mountain rankings, respectively. This leads us to the description of the different interaction techniques we implemented to solve the relevant tasks that were previously identified. Some examples of queries are listed here. We want the user to be able to analyze the performance of the leader of a team, but also any participant. Moreover, the time gaps between groups are relevant information that must be accessed easily. But besides these basic information tips, other more complex queries are also required. One of them is the changes in virtual leadership that might happen along the course of a stage. A virtual leader is a participant whose current position in the general ranking is not first, but that at a certain point of the stage, 
her advantage is large enough with respect to the other cyclists so that if the stage finished with the current time gaps, she would become the leader of the general ranking. This information must be monitored continuously by team directors, since this will influence in the strategic decisions taken along the stage. Another example is the analysis of the behavior of a certain team along the last part of the stage. Teams might be interested in chasing a breakaway or controlling the peloton to avoid breakaways in certain stages if they have a sprinter among them. In this case, we can see how the user can explore a stage. So he or she can hop onto the different sample kilometer points and see the partial rankings at this point and also at points of interest, such as special sprints or mountain passes. In this example, we see the exploration of groups. By hovering over a group, we can see whether they are in the front of the race or in a different group. In the first case, the total time is shown. In the second, we depict the time gap to their previous group which is the most relevant information. Here, we can see how riders can be highlighted by using the selection view on the right. When the user clicks on one of them, his trajectory is shown, as well as several biographic data on the bottom right view. The trajectory is patented with a color that is very similar to the color of the jersey to facilitate identification when several participants have been selected. Moreover, we can also change the colors of the trajectory at will by selecting the trajectory and the color picker tool. We can select all the members of the team at once using the Teams tab. The bottom right view initially shows information of the team, all its members, but we can also navigate through all the team members and see their personal data. One bit of information that is important to quickly check is the position of the leader not only the one of the general ranking, but also the ones of the different categories. That's the reason why they are equipped with a jersey that identifies them inside the peloton. To facilitate this exploration, we have a set of dedicated buttons on the top right of the main view that lets the user highlight the leader of each of the categories. So now we have the general leader, but we can select the other leaders of mountain, youth, and regularity. Once we have illustrated some of the basic queries, let's see how the user can access several more sophisticated ones. From the ones described in the paper, in this presentation, I will describe only a couple. The first one is the one we call chasing a breakaway. When a breakaway has been produced, a team may be interested in chasing it. For example, in none of the members of the team participates in it. But also, if the breakaway has some participant that is a threat in the general ranking for some team member. In bicycle races, this is achieved as follows. Some members of the team take head positions in the peloton and start increasing the speed. If they are lucky, some of the team will also be interested in chasing the breakaway and will also help. They will rotate taking the head of the peloton to ensure that the pace does not slow down. In this example here, we can see that a member of the group Hama team won the stage with a small difference with the second, and we want to make sense of what happened during the stage, since it shows that for most of the duration, there was a group that has been riding from far from the peloton. If we select the team from the right panel, we can see that early in the stage, some members of the group took the lead of the peloton and the presence of the members increased in the last half of the stage, and their efforts led to decrease the time gap. Finally, the peloton chased the escaped group near the end of the stage, and the rider could win. Note how the efforts of the team also caused the exhaustion of some of the members who were not able to finish with the peloton. As mentioned previously, stages with large time gaps between participants can lead to changes in the virtual leadership. This is typical of long, hilly stages where multiple breakaways happen along the stage and where cyclists that are highly ranked in the general classification participate in those breakaways. In this video, we illustrate those leader changes. Here we will see an example where the stage was a complete chaos that starts with the first mountain pass. If we hop to stage 11, we can see that many breakaways happened, and there were a lot of delays near the end. If we select the leader filter, we can see that it changed several times along the course of the stage. 
By analyzing different kilometer points, we can see how the partial rankings change continuously. So, for example, at 70 kilometers to finish, Powell takes the, the virtual leadership, and he's substituted by Valverde at 30 kilometers to finish, as it can be seen in this bottom right view. Finally, Thomas takes over near the end of the stage, and he ends as general leader. So, in order to evaluate the system, we did two different things. First, we compare the data that is usually provided by information sources with the data that we provide. To do so, we analyze the information that is given during TV broadcasting, and we read many long chronicles from different newspapers. In this case, we check L'Equipe from France, La Gazzetta dello Sport in Italy, and As and Marca from Spain. All of them are sports newspapers. We also analyze the information that is provided in dedicated websites. For this, we analyze web pages from Cycling News and Cycling Tips from the UK and Australia, respectively. We also gathered information from bicycle enthusiasts in Google Forms, as mentioned earlier. Here, you can see the different bits of information that are provided by the usual information sources, including the things that you may obtain with our application. On the left, you can see data that changes dynamically through a stage, and that, in most cases, is rarely offered by static media, such as newspapers. But remember that for TV broadcastings, for example, you only get this information in real time, so there are no possibilities of analyzing in detail the stage after it has finished. On the contrary, the interested user has to watch several hours of TV broadcasting in order to get these detailed insights. On the right, you can see data that summarizes the stage, which is easier to get. However, all the information such as the stage winner and the stage ranking are accessible and basically always present. All the data such as the leaders in the minor categories, such as youth or regularity, are rarely provided. Apart from that, we also evaluated the final application with several users. We had two different user groups. The first one consisted of eight cycling enthusiasts and practitioners. In the second, we had two domain experts, an UCI certified assistant director and mechanic, and the team director of a professional team. The mobility and contact limitations in Catalonia prevented us to do in-person demonstration in most of the cases, so we proceeded the following way. We prepared a session that consisted in an interactive demo done through video conference. Since our software is developed in Linux, it was not easy to deploy it to the users. So what we asked them was to guide us in the usage of the application in order to be able to evaluate how useful and easy to use it was. Then we had a discussion that in some cases lasted up to one hour and we ended asking the users to complete a questionnaire which was done offline. The application was highly appreciated by the users, which was shown by the comments we received during the demonstration, as well as the marks in the questionnaire. The domain experts thought at the beginning that the application was a finished one, and they found it very useful, and they told us that it was a product the teams would pay for. This brings us to the final discussion. As shown, we provide more relevant facts than other media. We also facilitate exploratory analysis of stages, which is something not provided by previous tools. Moreover, domain experts believe that it is useful for several tasks. For instance, they mention that in its current state, it could be used to prepare the briefing after the stage and the strategy for the next one. Moreover, they believe that if we had real-time data, it could also be used during the race to substitute the information they get in real time from, for example, to radio. However, our system still has some limitations. The first one is the access to real-time data, which is proprietary and difficult to get. Second is that we deal with a lot of non-structured input data, and therefore the cleaning processes are very, very time-consuming. Moreover, another issue, which is more a data problem, is that sometimes the GPS signal of some cyclists is lost. 
So, as said, we developed a new application for the exploration of multiple stage bicycle races. This application can be applied to races where groups are relevant, such as swimming in open waters, F1 races, and running, and it was highly appreciated by users. And with this, I want to conclude my talk. Thanks for your attention. Questions are welcome. And I would like to thank the projects that support it and also the users and domain experts that help us with the discussions on the application. And we are back. Hi, Pierre Paul. Nice to have you with us. A nice presentation. Uh, lots of applause coming from the different channels. Um, let me first of all tell that you had a collaborative approach of three different universities in Spain. This is something that I did not mention. Uh, Universitat Central de Cataluna, Universitat de Girona, and Universitat de Politecna in Cataluna. Um, so I guess your approach is also generalizable to the Volta. Would make sense to me. Um, I'm coming to the first question that is proposed by <laughs> Wolfgang Eigner. Um, second one is also related. It's both about the real-time capabilities. Uh, you already added to this in the discussion. I will still ask the question. Is tour is aimed at the visual exploration after the race stage or also dynamically during the race? Okay, so the idea is that we started thinking of something uh, that allows the users to know what happened after the race. But uh, as long as, uh, as we were working on the system, we realized that in some cases, if you are able to access to the data uh, in real time, uh, we could uh, kind of change a little bit the, the, the application because now the process of the data is kind of costly. Uh, and if we, if we got the data in a, in a let's say, nice uh, format, we could try to do this uh, in real time. Okay, so our, yeah, sorry. Yeah, however, the problem with the data is that we, we grab the data from, from the, the tour uh, website, but it's something that you cannot access freely because uh, I don't know if it's tour that uh, it, it, they hire a, a company that is called Data Dimension to track this data. And then this Data Dimension company sells the data to other uh, applications, but you need to pay for that. Yeah, I think this is a problem that many data scientists have also discovered in other applications. Um, second one uh, question is by Marco Agus, who is asking actually a very, very late question about data processing, as you have already mentioned. What are the requirements for using the system in sort of real-time staging contexts? Yeah, the, the problem is that uh, the data as we get it from the tour has some errors that I imagine it, will have, it would have if we got the original data and there are some things that we need to fix manually, like some ordering of the of the riders that sometimes is wrong, and also these GPS loss uh, things and so on. So if we got the data in the original version that Data Dimension is producing it, uh, we could probably create some more efficient uh, pipeline to, to deal with it, but we don't know exactly how it's uh, produced. So we download what is in the web page. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, different question is coming from Nigel John. He's asking about the power output of individuals and if this is included in the visualization and he apologizes if he missed it. It's not included in the visualization because we don't have these data. We know that, for example, for this year's Giro, uh, some uh, riders had this data provided by the website, but not all of them. And it's something that all teams have from, from their riders, but I'm not sure that they would uh, be willing to share. Uh, to everybody. So it's not completely clear because depending on the power, you know how much effort the rider has done and, and a team is interested into knowing what the other uh, riders have done. So it's uh, uh, kind of, um, can be delicate, let's say. That makes sense to me. Then the, the sport would turn into sort of Formula One where you know exactly how the, the fuel consumption is, blah, blah. I can imagine what you're meaning. I'm coming to the next question. Uh, Paolo Bruno is asking, um, Tracking the number of traversed galleries could be answered um, when all GPS signals in the same position are lost. Uh, it could be, I imagine that you refer to tunnels and, and this kind of geographic uh, things, but it, it's not, I mean, GPS gets lost from time to time for, and probably for all uh, riders, they actually, the, the, the cars also lost the signal lose the signal of the radio and so on while they are driving in mountains. So uh, I don't know if uh, it would be uh, robust enough, let's say. Got it. 
I would like to ask a question from, from my side. Um, I really like the table one with uh, all the capabilities of your approach compared to different solutions so far. Uh, very, very impressive, by the way, compliment from my side. Um, so I was thinking of generalizability. Uh, we already made a joke about the Vuelta. Um, my question would be if there are other sports where the approach is applicable to, and even beyond sports, if there are other use cases uh, where it would be applicable to, and what uh, different abstractions would be to make them compa comparable to that. Uh, and of course, uh, there would be an obvious uh, application, which is the number of questions raised by attendees of this session throughout the different talks. Yes, the, the, the first thing that uh, generates this ability, okay, for different sports, uh, one of the main components of our, our application is this tracking of groups, which is important in some sports, such as Formula One, uh, marathons, or swimming in open waters, all of these can benefit from the fact of, of uh, uh, having some riders, or the riders can benefit from, from running together or swimming together. So in this case, it's, it's, it's uh, interesting. Uh, also, some 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 users told us that um, it could also be, be be used for certain circumstances in F1, for example, uh, the, the undercuts or uppercuts when the when the cars are going to boxes and so on. The, the application could be used to predict uh, whether the other one would, would going would pass. And and for other applications, well, at the end we are doing something similar to to a Sankey diagram. So we have some specialized uh, interactions. Uh, but but yes, it's it's a kind of um, enhance or uh, uh, thing that can be applied. I don't know with the concrete case of the of the interventions because they they get mixed in the discord with the previous talk and so on. But but it could be something that we could um, check. Got it. Um, very quick side note from my side. When I looked at your visualization with the time axis and the line charts for the first time, I saw a decreasing temporal domain over the x-axis, which is very, very unnatural. Usually the time series says up going numbers. Almost every time time goes up and the value is always increasing. In your case, it's decreasing because it's the uh, remaining time that you need until you reach the goal and the finish. Can yeah, you yeah, it's ask about this sort of curiosity in the visualization design. It's 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 how I mean, uh, people when you're when you're when you're watching streaming, they talk about the kilometers to end. And they talk the whole time about the distance to the to the to the the head of the of the race. So it's something we discuss. We 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 uh, kind of crafted different uh, approaches to how we sort this or that. But it it, it ended up that it was the thing that we uh, feel it's it's more informative, especially for the for the domain experts or the people who are. Uh, strong enthusiasts uh, on, on bicycle. I think it's it's probably other solution to probably be, be good enough, but I think it's a little bit more natural this way. It is, but when I saw this, I, I wanted to know how how can it be? I must know the reason. I cannot proceed until I found out what it is. And of course, it was obvious that it's the goal to be reached. Um, I have to conclude the session because we are already a long time over the track. Um, and I would like to thank you for this talk number four. Thanks and a lot and thanks for listening to us. Absolutely. And would like to summarize and conclude the time series and animation session today uh, on a Friday morning. So I would like to say, first of all, Thomas Hurd, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I skipped your questions twice because you, you always have been a bit late. I'm sorry for that. Congratulations to Wolfgang Eichner, Jason Dykes, and Janadi Andrienko. You have been the most active question askers. And a big thanks to the overall audience uh, in any case for attending and asking questions, that was great. And of course, last but not least, thanks again to all the authors, speakers and question answerers. And yeah, with this applause, I'm concluding this session and wish you a nice day and a nice uh, yeah, final of this Euro session. Bye.